yourself. Getting better. I was going to ask you, Yvonne, how are you feeling? I'm feeling much better. Okay, good. And June, how about you? I'm feeling a lot better now. I had the, um, I was among the one or two percent that got, took that medication, the plaques of it. And mm -hmm. then I got, um, it was like if I got COVID all over again on Thursday. Oh, wow. Yeah, with all the symptoms. So, but today I'm still congested, but I'm feeling a lot better. Okay, good. Good. What was that you took, June? The the um viral infusion? The no, the Pax P A Pax Lovid, P A X L O V I D. Oh, oh, I took the um is that a pill form? Yeah, there are three three pills um twice a day for five days. Oh. And then like four days after I took the last one, mm -hmm. then I got, um, it was like if everything just reloaded and I got mm -hmm. all oh, the symptoms. Yeah, all, all the that viral, vi whatever in your system. Yeah. I had the, um after I was diagnosed as, um, as positive, I went to St. Francis and got the viral infusion. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because because of my blood pressure and you know I take medication and vitamins and stuff, they mm -hmm. didn't recommend the pill because um, you know it could be you know. Right. Right. Yeah. But I'm feeling you know only that if I move around too much, mm -hmm. try to think that I can do so much. Yeah. I feel a little winded and you know I gotta slow down. Right. Right. But I didn't lose my taste, my smell. I didn't, I wasn't congested, nothing like that. All I had was little body aches and, and um, nagging headaches. Oh, okay. So I think it was a mild form, you know? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Glad you're feeling better. Yeah, yeah coming I'm up glad, Thanks. I'm glad both of you are feeling better. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. So, um, tonight, we are at chapter seven. And we only have two more chapters in this book to go. Mm -hmm. So start thinking about what we might do next. Um, I do have, um, I do have a, a, a study. I'm not sure how long it <laughs> go. I have, I'm still going through the book, something that we can do over the summer. Um, but I'm open, I'm open to suggestions also. So tonight we're looking at Deborah and it says embracing the call of God. So our prayer, I thank you, Lord, that you love to do extraordinary things through ordinary people like me. Release me from any limitations I, others, or the enemy have put on my life that have kept me <clears throat> from the great plans you have for me, so that I might wake up and arise to shine the glory of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So the key scripture for, for this study was this Judges 5, 6 to 7, and, and 12, which you saw in the material. But I think that we need a broader um, base to talk about Deborah so I want to read, and I'm going to read from the message translation. Um, I'm going to read Judges 4, the whole chapter, Judges 4, through Judges 5, verse 12. The people of Israel kept right on doing evil in God's sight. With, a with Ahu dead... God sold them off to Jabin, king of Canaan, who ruled from Hazor. Sisera, <clears throat> who lived in Haraseth Hagoyim, was the commander of the <coughs> The people of Israel cried out to God because he had cruelly oppressed them with his 900 iron chariots for 20 years. Deborah was a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth. She was judge over Israel at the time. She held court under Deborah's palm between Ramah and Bethel in the hills of Ephraim. 
the people of Israel went to her in matters of justice. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, It has become clear that God, the God of Israel, <coughs> commands you, Go to Mount Tabor and prepare for battle. Then take ten companies of soldiers from Naphtali and Zebulun. I'll take care of getting Sisera, the leader of Jabin's army, to the Kishon River with all his chariots and troops. I'll make sure you win the battle. Barak said, if, if you go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. He said, of course I'll go with you. God, but understand that with an attitude like that, there'll be no glory in it for you. God will use a woman's hand to take care of Sisera. Deborah got ready and went with Barak to Kedesh. Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali together at Kedesh. Ten companies of men followed him, and Deborah was with him. It happened that Heber the Kenite had had parted company with, with the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' son in Moses's in-law. He was now living at Zaanamon Oak on Zaamon Oak near Kedesh. They told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. Sisera immediately called up all his chariots to the Kishon River. 900 iron chariots, along with all his troops who were with him in Harasheth Hagoyim. Deborah said to Barak, charge. This very day, God has given you victory over Sisera. Isn't God marching before you? Barak charged down the slopes of Mount Tabor, his 10 companies following him. God routed Sisera, all those chariots, all those <laughs> For Barak. Sisera jumped out of his chariot and ran. Barak chased the chariots and troops all the way to Haraseth Hagoyim. Sisera's entire fighting force was killed, not one man left. Meanwhile, Sisera, running for his life, headed for the tent of Jael, wife of Heber the Kenite. Jabin, king of Hazor, and Heber the Kenite were on good terms with one another. Jael stepped out to meet Sisera and said, Come in, sir. Stay here with me. Don't be afraid. So he went with her into the tent. She covered him with the blanket. He said to her, Please, a little water. I'm thirsty. She opened a bottle of milk, gave him a drink, and then covered him up again. He then said, Stand at the tent flap. If anyone comes by and asks you, is there anyone here? Tell him, no, not a soul. <coughs> then while he was fast asleep from exhaustion, Jael, wife of Heber, took a tent peg and hammer, tiptoed towards him, and drove the tent peg through his temple and all the way into the ground. He convulsed and died. Barak arrived in pursuit of Sisera, <clears throat> in pursuit of Sisera. Jael went out to greet him. She said, come, I'll show you the man you're looking for. He went with her and there he was, Sisera, stretched out dead with the tent peg through his temple. On that day, God sub subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. The people of Israel pressed, <clears throat> pressed harder and harder on Jabin, king of Canaan, until there was nothing left of him. That day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song. When they let down their hair in Israel, they let it blow wild in the wind. The people volunteered with abandon, bless God. Hear, O kings, listen, O princes. To God, yes, to God, I'll sing. Make music to God, to the God of Israel. When God, <clears throat> God, when you left Seir, marched across the fields of Edom, earth quaked. Yes, the skies poured rain. Oh, the <coughs> mountains left before God, 
the Sinai God, before God, the God of Israel. In the time of Shamgar, son of Anath, and in the time of Jael, public roads were abandoned. Travelers went by back roads. Warriors became fat and sloppy. No fight left in them. Then you, Deborah, rose up. You got up, a mother in Israel. God chose new leaders who then fought at the gates and not a shield or spear to be among them, the heavy <laughs> companies of Israel. Lift up your hearts high, lift your hearts high, O Israel, with abandon, volunteering yourselves with the people. Bless God. You who rode on prized donkeys, comfortably mounted on blankets, and you who walk down the roads, ponder, attend. Gather at the town well and listen to them sing chatting the tale of God's victories, his victories accomplished in Israel. Then the people of God went down to the city gates. Wake up, wake up, Deborah. Wake up, wake up, sing a song. On your feet, Barak, take your prisoners, son of Abinoam. There ends the reading. I felt it was necessary to give you all of that backstory from Judges 4 because just those couple of verses don't really tell the full story of Deborah. So now let's look at what, um, what the writer of this study has to say. So, I mean, in the intro section, you know, she says that the story of Deborah in Judges 4 and 5 begins like many of the stories in the book of Judges. And, and this is true. It, it's called the book of Judges. Why? Because the Israelites just don't get it. You know, God keeps coming to their rescue and then they turn around and forget about God. After, after they get what they want, then they turn around and forget about God. So it's the Judges stories are, 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 pretty much like that all through Judges. Israel gets help from God. Israel <laughs> turns around like God doesn't exist. And then they have to call on God again to help them. So, um, so that, but that's why I wanted you to hear that chapter four, be so you can hear how, um, from, from the beginning, how Deborah is mixed into this story. So if you did, did, did anyone have a chance to read any of this? So I know how, how much of it to cover before I get to questions or, and if not, it's fine. I'll just, I'll just keep moving forward. Yes, Pastor, I read it. I read some of it. Okay. Hi, Pastor, just joining. Yes, I, you might. My audio is not working too well, so can I'm not sure if you can hear me, but yes, I read it. It was chapter seven. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And oh. we can hear you fine in that. Oh, okay. And Jessica did a hands uh thumbs up, so that means she read it too. I read it as well. Okay, so I'm not gonna bother going too deep into what she wrote here because I think her questions will pull, will pull some things out. So we'll go over the questions first and then we'll, and then we'll backtrack. <coughs> so I do want to read her conclusion and then we'll take a look at the questions. In her conclusion, she says, women and, men, women and men of God, it's time for you to be bold and courageous and do the unique and amazing things God is calling you to do. Wherever the Lord has placed you, you will accept Will you accept the challenge to be a light in the darkness for the kingdom of God? Will you encourage others to do it too? Wake up and rise to shine the glory of God everywhere you go. You carry the hope this world needs, the hope of Jesus Christ. And it's time to stop hiding and playing small. A dying, hopeless world is waiting for you to be obedient. Believe and trust God Believe and trust God has the very best plan for you and follow him to where he is working today. 
And then she has a suggestion for a book, A Deeper Dive, uh, the, uh, the Deborah Anointing, which is not a book that I have or have read. So I can't recommend it one way or another. But the question, so I'm going to skip the prayer practice for now. Um, but I'm going to jump to question three. Even, I mean, like in though, in the, in what I read or in what <coughs> you read, in what I read in Judges four and five, or in what you read in this week's chapter, um, what, stood out for you, what surprised you, um, what challenged you, what unsettled you? Um, hey guys. So, Hi, Jessica. Hey. So I know this story or have read, you know, judges to know about Deborah but so I can't say anything surprised me but what stood out was um um judges seven where she says um four was, seven or five seven I'm sorry five seven judges five seven um and in the commentary I don't know what version it is but it reads, villagers in Israel would not fight. <clears throat> they held back until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. And the writer goes on to describe her um, as a mother. <laughs> I just found that that was very interesting because that wouldn't necessarily have been the, even though she referred to herself as a mother, that wouldn't have been like the deep dive that I took when looking at Deborah. Mm. Such as, you know, people have looked deep into her being a judge or being a prophet and even being, I guess, this military leader, if you will, but not so much as the mother piece. So I guess I didn't even notice that she had even described herself that way. So it's interesting that you said she described herself that way because Deborah is not the one who's speaking. Oh, I must have read the I wrong. Hold on, the I. Wait, what? Oh, wait. Uh, I thought she meant until I, Deborah, arose. So, but you don't know which tra which translation you're reading from. Um, I mean, I could find it. It's written that way in the description on page um, 59. Oh, oh kind so of book. It's, it's kind of, oh. it's read that way in um, the New King James version. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, that she <laughs> referenced herself. <laughs> yeah, she's using the, the pronoun I, so I'm just thinking, you know, she was talking about herself. Until okay. I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. Mm hmm Okay. Um, so, so I have to, I have to say, I have to say this. Um, well, because I don't, I don't, I don't have the, the King James. I have the King James version, but I do not have the New King James version. Um, neither King James, neither King James version of the Bible. Any any translation you find with King James is not a scholarly trans translation. Yeah, yeah. And so there are that there are some things that are problematic in their language. <laughs> what about I just pulled it up in my Bible. I have a NIV. I have a couple. Mm -hmm. but the one I have is NIV. She uses the writer or whoever <laughs> uses I. In that particular, um, I actually, I don't know if it's she's writing it or if somebody is saying that in this song, because it says that Deborah and Barack sang this song. So in whatever song, Deborah and Barack sang the song. Right, Deborah refers to herself as, as I, I Deborah, 
a mother in Israel. Uh, okay, that's a little problematic translation, but I'm not gonna get. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> um, because if we if we go back to to the to the Hebrew language, there's there's no way that that should be translated that way. But I'm not gonna go that deep into it. Um, the other the other the other issue that would be problematic is that. You know, if we re remember that the canon was written, the canon was originally transcribed and written by men, right? And so there's no way that men would have, I mean, it's, 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 it's amazing that she has a name. You know, we've talked about this before, that not, there are not many women who are named in the Bible. So it's amazing that she has a name. But to think that the translators would actually attribute her to saying something is probably uh, a stretch at, at the minimum. So I would just say that's probably a poor translation of the original text. But you get the message. Okay, um, so I have another like, question or comment. So sure. to that point, I read somewhere else that... I read somewhere else where it had a star next to where it says um, wife of Lip Lapidoth. Lipidoth. Mm -hmm. Lipidoth. Lipidoth. And mm -hmm. the asterisk said that there were biblical scholars who believe that Deborah is a wife too, but that the Hebrew word there can also be translated as woman instead of a wife. Because there's no other place that describes what Lapidoth is, if it's a place or a person. Correct. And and the truth of the matter is, almost any place in the Hebrew scripture where we see the word wife, probably the word is, the Hebrew word is woman. But because of relationship, in as, as folks translated it, they translated it as wife. So we don't really know. And then, you know, because, and also we have to remember during those times, um, men, men had wives and they had concubines. So the word woman, you know, generic. Mm. But, 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 but suffice it to say that she was a powerful woman. I mean, she was married to a man who had who had power, and she also had power, <clears throat> which yeah. which was which I'm not so sure that it was uncommon, but it's not common in scripture. They said, Pastor, that um, she was a woman of great wisdom and revelation. Mm -hmm. And that she was uh, uh, a judge uh, that I, I guess a lot of the, the, the people brought their problems to her for mm -hmm. her to decide on. So, um, you know, a woman of great wisdom, revelation and discernment, she was able to judge. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, from uh, from the uh, book, but they said she was a busy woman as well. Well, she she would have had to have been very busy, busy. because if you know she was judging, um, she was. Um, it seems like I mean, like she she had so she and she had some ties to military. Um, yes, and. Um, and being a woman, she probably she has probably domestic things that were that she had to tend to as well. So, um, you know, I always say in these stories, it's a shame that we don't get a fuller view of 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 the person. We can only you know use our imaginations to to, to think about what you know, uh, to think about what their total life was. <clears throat> so 
So anything else to surprise anyone or um or or trouble you about this text or this Bible study, this particular chapter? Wait, I, I have no, I have two more things. So one, okay. I feel like based off of what we've all been saying, it's almost like the writers literally had no choice but to name her because of how um because of how powerful she was but also because like there could possibly be a historic tracing to this person because she was a judge at that time so it's not like the woman at the well that could have been just a story like no this was an actual leader so you had to give her a name or else like you know it would have been a bad thing um right good so point. That. and then i guess i also never realized that she's like the um she's like the I was about to say a cuss word. She's like the bad chick in this story. Like she's got it going on, right? But then you have, <laughs> but then you have this other woman in the story who literally killed this guy. And they talk about her for like three lines, but right. she's Thank like you. so I was hoping someone, I was hoping someone mm -hmm. would bring that up. You know, we have we have Jael who you know, like I mean, she 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 lured the leader of the whole thing. She lured Cicero into her tent, made him comfortable, and waited until he went to sleep, and then killed him. Yeah. yeah. And you know, and they 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 only chose to to give her you know a couple of words. So yes, it, that would say that. They definitely had to, I mean, another reason why they, de I feel that they definitely had to um, name Deborah was because Barack, who was the head of the, the military forces, said, I'm not going if you don't go. So not only was she a judge, I think that she also was a warrior. I mean, she was also part of the military. That's why, because why would someone say, if you don't go, I'm not going. <laughs> the man and the man who is the head, the commander of all these, of all these military forces. Mm -hmm. So that was the one thing, thank you, Jessica. That was the one thing that really stood out to me was that, you know, Jael, was was just as in my mind just as important in this story because she went for the, as soon as the top man came to her tent you know she she knew he was running and as soon as he got there she's like okay yeah I, i'm gonna help you sure mm -hmm. So anything else from 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 this chapter? Troubling or surprising or something new that you learned? Well, it also said that um, if she had not been obedient to act on what the Lord told her to do, uh, nothing would have changed. She used the place of trust and authority she had, had been given as a judge to inspire Barack to rise up an mm. army. So she listened to what God, you know, like they called her, Deborah was a worshiping warrior. She, she followed God's instructions. Mm -hmm. Whatever he told her to do, that's what she did. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody else? Uh, I, have a um, I was just 
Okay, so that's Yv Yvonne and who? Somebody else was getting ready to say something. Me, June. Okay, so <laughs> Yvonne and June. Uh, Pastor, I'm just, uh, you know, after reading um, a, a part of, of the story, it just reminds me um, when it says Deborah's story would not be complete without Jail or Jail, whatever. Um, you know, I just think about, you know, our congregation that, you know, it does, you know, you, keep, you always say that, um, we need you need everyone to step up and 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 you know help the church to move forward mm -hmm. so it doesn't mean that the person have to be um the congregant have to be a, a, a seminarian or a deacon the least of these you know could because she she wasn't she she wasn't known that Jahil, but look at the contribution that she made. Mm -hmm. So I am thinking that um, you know, um, numerous times you said that you need need us to step up with you. See, Jahil, um, she stepped forward, and maybe if she didn't step forward and 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 got rid of Sisera, um, maybe Deborah wouldn't have of oh, you know she wouldn't have been so successful, you know? So, you know, right. I'm thinking that, you know, you keep saying, you know, that the congregation, you alone, okay, Deborah was the leader, just like you are the leader of our church, but you alone can't do it. Mm -hmm. So you, we need people that, like Jail, that is bold enough, you know, yeah. to step forward. And, and 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 move our congregation forward. Yes. That's what I got out of right there. You know, you don't have to be, you know, a seminarian with degrees or whatever. She was a tent, she was a homemaker in a tent and look mm -hmm. at her contribution. Yeah. So that that that's what I got from right there. Thanks. Good point. June. My question was, um, it said the Lord, my Bible says the Lord, the God of Israel has given you this command, take 10,000 men from the tribes, and it went on. So my question is, how did, how did the Lord, who gave the commandment? How, how did the, they know that it was from the Lord? Okay, so first, I w you need to tell me exactly where you're reading from so I can look at that. Um, um, it is chapter 4, verses 6. <clears throat> in, in my Bible, it says, One day she sent for Barak, son of Abinom, from the city of Kadesh in Nephtali, and said to him, the Lord, the God of Israel has given you this command. Take 10,000 men from the tribes of Nephali and Zebulun and lead them to Mount Tabor. Mm -hmm. uh, so who gave the command? How do they know that it was the Lord? I mean, did God come down and speak to them? Uh -huh. So good question. Very good question. Because if we go back um <clears throat> if which i did i mean if you go back to um go back even in judges in judges 3 there's nothing mentioned about god talking to deborah but then here we come to chapter 4 mm -hmm. And chapter four starts off, it says the Israelites again did what was evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin, blah, 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 blah. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lapida, was judging Israel. She, and it tells you where she used to sit, where she held, where she held court. And then it says she summoned Barak and told him what the Lord God said. So now here's what, here's what 
I have to assume that because she was a prophetess, that she talked to God on a regular basis, right? And basically what that means is that she, you know, in, in my mind, she prayed constantly, you know? And um, so how do we hear the voice of God? Um, it doesn't say that God came directly to her and said, and said this. Did she discern this in her own spirit? We, we, we don't know. The text doesn't tell us. But she was a prophetess, and so, so she was, by what we read in the text, and by what you know, what, the way that Barack reacted towards her. Obviously, she was a woman of God that people trusted and believed, and so when she said, "This is what the Lord is saying you need to do," they believed her, and they did it. But we don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us how she got that revelation. And this is the thing about scripture. <laughs> Go back to the thing about taking things literally. Like if we took that, we don't have enough there to make a whole story out of that. All we can do is imagine, right? Yes. And you might think one thing when you read it and somebody else might think something else. Who's to say who's right or wrong? Scripture does not tell us that. Mm -hmm. You can only make conjecture. Does that help? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? So to let's so let's go to the other questions that are here, and I'm just going to read them all. You can speak to them if you want or not. And I have some other questions of my own that I came up with too. If we don't get through these, but what kinds of prayer practices have been helpful as you seek to draw closer to God? Describe a time when God helped make clear something you were called to do. What do you hear the Spirit saying? to you, your family, your church, your community. Don't all speak at once. <laughs> It's all women on here tonight. I'll say it's all men. You know, so say, come, I'm gonna say, come on, women of God. I know I know you all, or at least I assume you all pray. Um so well, to the last question about what do you hear God saying? Um I've been doing uh, you know how on the Bible app they have little plans. So I've been doing a lot of plans related to God's calling because I'm trying to figure out what that is in my life. And I guess I'm still looking for, I'm still practicing to be silent so I can hear what the spirit is saying and asking it to be clear. But I can simply say that it's hard. Like stepping into your kingdom calling is hard because it requires you to probably step out of your comfort zone I don't think that, I mean, looking at this particular story of Deborah, that your kingdom calling is something that's gonna be easy and just fall into your lap. Because Deborah was a judge. She wasn't necessarily that we know of until this, a warrior. So I can imagine what it's like to go from judge and prophet to like warrior that's not, you know, a simple or general thing so I don't know what my calling is but I do know that God is asking me to be um open to whatever it is 
and trust that even though it's going to be really hard, um, that like this study has said, he's going to be there if you just like remain faithful. Um, and I think to like something that Miss Yvonne said about you needing people to step up. I think one thing that stops people from stepping up is, especially women, is this desire to feel like you have to do everything perfect. So mm -hmm. like, I'm not gonna step up or commit to leading a prayer ministry because what if my prayer messes up and what if I say, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Like, you know, I can't join the choir because I might crack or <laughs> no. So I feel like sometimes as women, we just let perfection get in the way of what God is calling us. Amen. But if we just remain in prayer like Deborah, then maybe we'll be more comfortable to just do whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's all, all of what you said, Jessica, is, is, is really right on point. But yeah. I would say Amen, that, Jessica. I would say that generally th that <clears throat> perfection thing is a human trait. Mm -hmm. You know, none of us, I mean, to, 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 to show our imperfections means that we have to, we have to be willing to be vulnerable, you know? And, and that's really hard for people. And um, I mean, like the deacons and, and the altar guild and probably the choir um, and maybe the ushers. I mean, they hear this from me more often than the, the congregation in general does. I say to them all the time, it doesn't have to be perfect. We're just going to do it, you know, because I notice, you know, like folks will stop and they'll say, it's like, oh, well, what about so-and-so? I'm like, we don't have to be perfect. We're not ever gonna be perfect. We are, as I say, we are perfectly imperfect beings. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's never gonna happen. And so that's, I think a lot of times, that's why um, I tend to use myself as an example in my sermons, because I want people to see, like, I'm not afraid to put my stuff out there because it's out there all the time anyway. Like I'm the, I'm the focus of attention. So if I mess up, it's, it's out there loud, you know? Um, but, you know, just to, to kind of help people see that it's fine. Like it's not the end of the world when you make a mistake or if things don't go perfectly, you just keep moving. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, like, yeah, you can uh, go. You can go. Yeah, Pastor, like Jessica, um, uh, spoke on about you know afraid of being of messing up. Um, that is my major um problem, afraid of messing up. Um, but I think if we if we we truly um rely on God, knowing that he's not going to call us to do something. And that's a faith thing. And I think it it, it, it it takes time because he would never call. I don't think he'd ever call us to do his work and know that we're going to fail. I, I think he's going to give us what we need to succeed. But like Jessica said, you know, it's, and you say it's a humanness in us. Uh, you know, we 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 just we just we're just afraid to fail. And so you know? it's like it's so. Just... And I don't, you know, it's like I say this all the time. It's like I don't, I don't necessarily remember my sermons exactly or even vaguely most of the time after they're over because I very rarely read them again. I don't watch the tapes, the the, the recordings, and so I don't. But I like when I read a scripture, I can vaguely remember like some <clears throat> ideas that I might have had about it before. So I know recently I've said something, you know, like about how, you know, when we are, if we're listening and we're paying attention, the thing is, well, I'll, I'll just so it. We have these things that we say all the time. We say the Lord's Prayer. Um, you know, this Sunday, past Sunday, was the 23rd Psalm. Like, 
So how much of what we say do we really believe? How much of that is really incarnational in us? Yes. You know, if you say it and you really believe it, then, and that's not to say that it's going to take the fear away because in our humanness, that's just part of who we are. But if you say it and you believe it, then you know, not just intellectually, you know in your heart that all you need to do, to, you know, all you need to have is right in you or around you. So what would stop you from moving forward? <laughs> You know, and so that's, again, so like Jessica said, so it's a faith thing, yes. you know, and, and like, I, I, you know, I think I use the example in the sermon about faith being more like this never ending spiral that we're always, you know, we're going, we go from one, we go from, from, from trust to doubt. We go from boldness to, 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 um, you know, to, to being afraid, but, but that's, because we are human and that is probably never going to change. You know, I, I, I shared with the deacons probably early on when I first got here, because somebody, somebody asked me one Sunday back while we were praying before we get ready to come out. It's like, you know, well, you know, do you, do you ever get nervous? <laughs> I said every single Sunday, every single Sunday, because it's a big responsibility to stand in front of people and act like I know what God is trying to say to folks. It's a huge responsibility, but I don't do it by myself. I mean, I do it in prayer. I do ask the Holy Spirit. I always believe that the word that I have is what the Holy Spirit gave me. But my first preaching professor in seminary said the day that you can walk into church and not be nervous is the day you need to stop. So, yes, you know, it's, we, we all have our feelings of inadequacies, but should that hold us back? I don't think so. Especially not when we say all of these things that we believe. So come on, who's next? I saw a couple people perk up <laughs> like you had something to say. I think about prayer. It seems to be a mainstay in my life. I, um, I don't know if there's a right or wrong way to pray. And I really don't care. I good I, I i i'm not being as flippant about it it's just that what i pray i just pray i just feel i'm i'm cleansed i'm i've, I've done it it's in his hands so let it alone um and then sometimes like i feel that i cheat i say um the lord um oh, please help us and then I put my family first mm -hmm. instead of the whole world and everybody around me. I said, uh, let's help Glenn and Dana and Glenda and all of the rest. And anybody else who happens to trickle along. But it doesn't mean that I, I'm, I, I think I did it wrong. It's just what was in my heart at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to pray I felt you had to do it in the evening, just before bed. And especially now, I find myself to run out of prayer all the time. And there again, I think it's because of my situation. So maybe I'm cheating. Um, do I, would I do this if things were not the way they are for my family right now? I don't know, but they, but that's the way it is. And I don't make any apologies for it. That's the way it is. I, um, I feel that he's listening. And sometimes I just say, 
Uh, dear Lord, help me. And he knows what I'm talking about. And I shut up and go to bed and that's it. And then sometimes I kind of drag on. So prayer for me is almost like an ending of the day. Even if it's in the morning, it's like a cleansing type of thing. Um, and I uh, hope that he's not too busy to listen. This is what I feel. Thanks, Ernestine. And, and that, that showcases, you know, some other things that probably a lot of us think about and maybe never verbalize. So Mike, whenever someone comes to me with something like what you just said, Ernestine, the, my first question is, who made the rules about prayer? Who? Who made the rules? And what are the rules? You know, I think that, you know, one of the rules, which I never did with my kids and they don't do with their kids. I never made my kids pray before they went to bed. We always prayed at mealtime. They knew that I always had devo devotional time in the morning because that was a time, as long as my bedroom door was closed, do not open it. But I think that, you know, we, we become acculturated, you know, in certain ways, you know, not, you know, me growing up in a fundamentalist church. I mean, like I had a whole ton of rules that I had to make sure I lived by every single day of my life. But, you know, I always say who made the rules? Like these rules were made by men. God didn't make these rules and say, you must pray in the morning. You must pray at this time. Those aren't the, you pray. And I feel that generally most people of faith are <coughs> praying even when they don't realize they're praying. Like when you say, God help me, that's a prayer. You don't have to say, God help me. I lift this to you in the name of Jesus. I mean, like all those prescribed things, there's, there's no rule. And so we, uh, I, I'll say we punish ourselves <laughs> because we feel like we haven't, you know, we haven't made the mark, so to speak. We haven't done what we should do. There are no rules. The thing is like you and your relationship, your relationship with God is personal. You know, some days I don't have, because I'm some days I don't have time for what, quote unquote, a formal prayer time. But I know that I pray throughout the day. I have these things that I call breath prayers. So every now and then, like when I, because on my watch, I have a, you know, every hour when it goes off that I need to get up, if, especially if it's a day I know I'm going to be stuck at my desk all day. When my alarm goes off for me to move while I get up and do my 250 steps or whatever, while I'm doing that, I talk to God for a couple minutes. You know, that's a prayer. So don't be so hard on yourself and don't feel like it's cheating because what is that? You know, you're talking to God and believe me, I think for, it can be said for all of us that we might, you know, especially when things are going on with you personally and with your family personally, that could be what, the, that's the priority on your prayer list. That's okay. So whenever you find yourself, you know, thinking, well, is this wrong? Uh, am I doing it? Just stop yourself and say, I mean, this, this was my way of breaking myself of that habit. I stop myself and say, who made that rule? I mean, I would ask myself that question. Who made that rule? When I think about the fact that there was some man somewhere that made the rule, I know I don't have to adhere to that. And understand that my relationship with God is is you is as unique as I am. Right? Pastor, thank you for that. Thank you for that. I need I needed to hear that. And I've listened, this is Rob. 
and I've listened to everyone speak. I'm one of those people that I just like to, you know, we're not perfect, but you want to make sure that you say the right thing. Sometimes we don't think before we speak. And so therefore you're kind of fearful that you say something and after you've said it, it's too late. It's already been, been stated and you didn't mean to say it that way, but you said it. And so we get so caught up. So just listening to everyone state you know, their feelings and how they, how they feel about some things, how they see. I'm just very thankful for all to hear, you know, for you stating it in the, in the way that you said it, because everything you've said, I relate to it. Absolutely. So I thank you. I thank you for that. Very true. I second that. Yeah. I second that. Our third. I third that. I fourth. <laughs> fourth. Yes. yes. I third it, second it, fourth it, everything. Right yeah, with you guys. I, yes, yes. Yeah, we, we and, and that's, I mean, we, we try to be gracious with others and then we don't give ourselves the same grace. What's that about? <laughs> True. You know, we have to give us, I, I mean, I feel if you can't off, if you can't give yourself some grace, it's really hard to extend true grace to others. And so we've got to give, we've got to cut ourselves some slack, give ourselves some grace. And I feel well, as well, they say we're our worst critics. Right. And I feel that as a community of faith, grace should be our first approach. If your first approach is that you get upset about something that somebody said, then I have to question. I mean, for me personally, because I, you know, like, and, and because I, I guess I meet with the deacons and council more often than anyone else, you know, I, you know, they get afraid for me, <laughs> like, well, um, maybe this is going to upset you. It's like, I don't take anything. I don't take stuff personally, you know, and maybe that's for me. I always say like my life path, like maybe that's why I was an auditor. Like God knew that I needed to spend that time as an auditor before I became a pastor because who likes to see the auditor coming in? Who wants to hear what the auditor has to say? Well, I did that for 25, 25, 27 years. So my skin is very thick and I don't take things personally. Do I get upset about some things? I get upset more about situations than I get about upset about what people say because I know people say th stuff that they really don't mean a lot of times or they're trying to be mean. <laughs> but grace goes a long way and and you got to start with you you know be easy be easy on yourself and then it's much easier to be gracious to others okay. that doesn't mean you become a doormat now so <laughs> Don't, absolutely don't don't hear don't hear me saying that <laughs> anybody else <clears throat> so i just want to say now that we're like we're close to the end. We've only got two more chapters to go in this book. Um, what thoughts do, or do you have any thoughts about why we don't explore these women's stories more in our churches? <laughs> Come on, Jessica. <laughs> I see that look. Is the people in the higher ups are mainly males. Because the higher ups are mainly males. Okay, that's. I feel like I can go on and on. <laughs> okay, well, just give us a little bit. <laughs> like, um, like Miss June said, yes, the higher ups are men, but it's just the world that we live in like the Bible from way back when these stories in the Bible have somehow established 
this way of life and how women are supposed to be treated or not treated or unnamed and it still lives on today and so it's just like history repeating itself or maybe history just living out itself so that's why we don't learn it I think we should I think more men should be sitting around having these bible studies than women who already know but I was encouraged when we first started because we had four men in the Bible study and they've all kind of, they've drifted out week by week until there were none. And, um, but yeah, that's, um, that's it. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Maybe pastor too, as women, we don't speak up. We, I guess as women, we tend not to be forceful you know, we kind of glide our our opinions into, like you said, a male dominated. But I think as women, that's something, you know, I know that I have to work on is speaking up. I might be thinking a lot, but then I don't say, you know, I don't say anything. But um, I think as women, we we need to speak up, you know. And maybe it's not what we say, but how we say it, because sometimes, you know, you come across as not what, you know, people, you know, the way they perceive you, um, you know, maybe because we said it harshly, but just, just, just speaking up, you know, especially when it comes to our church, um, you know, what we can do, how we can involve or get other people involved, you know? like looking for more ushers, maybe we can make an announcement as part of that, you know, to say, hey, does anyone want to join the team, you know, the ushering team, this is what it requires, you know, just just speaking up. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. That that all those things are absolutely true. And um, believe me, it's not any easier in ministry, you know, um, To be in a room of mostly men, mostly white, um, on at a lot of the tables that I sit at, and I know that the the immediate expectation is that I'm going to be quiet and I'm going to wait to be told what to do. But that's just not my nature. <laughs> it just, I mean truthfully, I was really, I really was born this way. I mean, I cannot tell you how many, uh, uh, with my mother and my father and my grandparents, how, you know, my mouth got me in a lot of trouble (laughs) only because I always ask questions. I, you know, I, I'm the kind of person, which I guess that's, that made me good in my in, in accounting and 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 an order, I don't take things at face value. Don't tell me just because <laughs> that's not a reason to me, mm-hmm. you know. So I've I've always been that way uh, from a child, and I think that um, what is typically expected of us as women, whether we're in leadership or not is that we are going to wait for someone else to to lead us. Mm. And truth be told, we're always leading. Even if we are leading from from behind, we're all we're always the ones that are leading. And and when I was when I had that affirmed for myself in my young adulthood, I vowed for me that I didn't have to wait for a man to give me permission. You know, I'm not going to be disrespectful or anything like that, but I don't have to wait because my mind and my ability is no different from yours. Yeah. Pastor, I also think that what we are doing or what we are want to do is almost not accepted by the older generations. Somehow, and I know that you probably probably face it in our own church, 
that it is okay for women to be deaconess or to help pass the uh, plates or even help with the communion or, but to actually lead. I want to think it's an old mentality. However, I'm not sure if it is a very old because it might be some that is stuck with some of our younger people and we have to continue to push forward that uh, our minds are just as good as, just as sharp as the men's mind. And quite often we can do things faster um, as long as it's not physical strength uh, that we should be taken just as seriously as um, a man. Mm -hmm. And I think with our, and I put myself, I, I know that anybody look at Ms. Oh, Mrs. Bright, you're over there with the older generation. Somehow I put myself with the younger generation um, and yeah. my thinking that I don't have to, like you said, I don't have to be always three steps behind. I could be beside or I could even lead. And fortunately, I was brought up that way um, with the mm -hmm. uh, we had to do. But I think we're not going to see that many women talked about in the Bible until we get the mindset that the people in the Bible, the women in the Bible, had a very important role, just as important as some of the men in the Bible. Is that more? So I asked that question because, you know, and maybe you can pray with me about this um, because I, what, what I am thinking and what has come up for me, what has uh, arisen in my spirit from this Bible study is that, because I have a lectionary that's called a woman's lectionary where for every Sunday out of the church year, there's some woman that can be preached about or some sub, you know, so I've been thinking about for the next lectionary year using the woman's lectionary so that I'm preaching about women every Sunday. Um, so pray with me about that so I can get some clarity on what the spirit is is calling me to do. In, in that vein, because I, I do, like when someone said earlier about, you know, men should hear this too, because very seldom, I mean, you know, and I think I may have mentioned this when we were going through Advent, like the, the most that you hear in, you know, in our scripture readings are generally, you know, the woman at the well, Mary and Martha, you know, Mary Magdalene, um there you go yeah yeah a pastor i'd love for you to um do something on um oh gosh and i, I and it's funny that that you you know the kind of pastor the kind of woman you are you didn't bring it you didn't bring it up um Hugala, um Oh, those three sisters that step up to Moses and say, listen, I want my inheritance. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, what's three, the name again? Hugala? Uh, I can't um, think of the three names right oh, now. Lord. Like, yes, we have them. Yeah, but you know who I'm talking about. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, but there, yes. there are they many. They should have put them in this book here. There are <laughs> many, many. This should, this should be in this book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but like, I mean, but we do have, like, we have, we have Ruth and Naomi. That's not Ruth. The Ruth and Naomi is not even in our lectionary. It never gets read on a Sunday morning. Oh. And I know for a fact, I mean, you know, I know for a fact that, and it's been, because this has been done in study after study after study. Most people, the only Bible that they hear and or read is what they hear in church. Yes. And so there's all these stories that people never hear and they're never explored, you know? Um, so anyway, that's what has risen up in my spirit from this time that we spent together 
um, on this study. So um, sounds good. You know, so I'm thinking about because I like over that. the years I've done many studies on um, women in the Bible. I mean, I, I, I have a ton of resources, but I've, re you know, and occasionally I will preach, you know, I'll move to preach about a woman's story, but um, I'm just feeling more and more like maybe, you know, like this isn't just for Bible study. I mean, there are ways to, to use those stories for, um, for preaching as well. So pray with me about that. Because okay. before we know it, the next liturgical year will be here. Yes. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> so anything else on anybody's mind about Deborah and and her boldness? I mean, I also feel like, you know, Deborah's call to us is a call to be bold. Yes. Um and and that is not always easy, you know. <laughs> um I uh, I was in a couple of meetings earlier today, and um, I think you know in, in the over the next couple of years in, in our church body, especially those of us who belong to congregations that are primarily people of color, we are going to need to be bold. Yeah, and we're going to need to speak out. Um, mm -hmm or we're going to need to leave the denomination that we're a part of. Mm. <laughs> that's a whole, that's a whole other <laughs> thing that's going on there. But, um, but yeah, you know, because um, a meeting that I was in, uh, uh, we had a meeting last night with some folks from Churchwide here at, at Good Shepherd. We um, were asked to be part of a group that's going to evaluate some new stewardship um, materials. And so they came to, to speak with just a small group of us last night, just to get us, uh, just to get a, a, a taste for who we are and, um, what our thoughts were on certain things. But, um, I met with, um, uh, pastor Nick who came from, um, who came from church front office. We met afterwards and, so I know, I think last year I gave a number of like the number of black roster leaders in the ELCA. And, and I said, it was, I think I'd, I'd have to go back and look at my notes now, but I'm sure it was something in like 520. Well, as of today, there's only 402 roster leaders of color. So that means deacons and pastors in our church body so when you talk about there's 18,000 rostered leaders in our church body and only four there's wow. only 402 who are people of color wow what a wow. disparity yeah. oh my right. and so and so that's why I, like when you know and i know it's hard for for most people at good shepherd to wrap their heads around that because like this is a black church, but, and this is why I constantly try to push us to be involved in the wider church so that folks can see that we are not, the, we are not the majority. We're not, we, you know, we're not anywhere near the majority in this church. So, um, and and consequently, the the church is really start is more more than ever really acting like it definitely doesn't care about us. I mean, some of you who were in an early Bible study that I did, you know, about I showed those two videos on "Do Black Churches Matter" in the ELCA that I was a part of back in 2015, and um, so some of the things I said then I would say them even stronger <laughs> now. Wow. Because, Things have not improved at all. They've only gotten worse. Um, I have a friend who's a pastor in um, Charlotte. She's not um, ELCA. She's at a Baptist church. And she was actually quoted in an article about like the great resignation of pastors across denominations. Um, 
just because of how pastors have been treated um, and the struggle with coming back from COVID and all that stuff. And it, I feel like the numbers as pastors are decreasing, it's kind of resembling just people who no longer identify with a denomination or mm -hmm. they don't want to be identified as a Christian because of this crazy evangelical movement that's been rebirthed that kind of resembles like the clan or something but mm -hmm. it's kind of like <laughs> yeah. overall yes, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's like a cross religion yes that people are just leaving church mm -hmm. altogether right, right. But i think that i it's definitely not easy but i feel like a lot of pastors and churches have to find different ways to reach those people and reach Absolutely. new people. Like, I feel like they're so focused on ch changing people instead of changing mm -hmm. the church. Right, there you go. Yeah. Right, right. So You're like, so right, Jessica. Mm, that is so absolutely right. true. You are right on point. You are, that's absolutely, you are absolutely right. And that's pretty much what I talk about all the time. Yeah. So, you know, um, but again, you know, we we have a way of, you know, and tradition is, I mean, tradition is fine. There's nothing wrong with tradition. But the other, the reality is if we don't move with the times, all those traditions that we hold so dear are going mm, to go crashing yes. in the water anyway. So yes. what good will they be then? Mm-hmm. You know, so so we have to find a way to, you know, and, and a lot of times holding on to, on to tradition isn't necessarily a good thing. It doesn't necessarily help move you forward. You know, um, I mean, like I have some, just, you know, I have some friends who, you know, as their kids got, you know, as their kids grew and, and you know, got married and whatever, so, but they are, it's like, we are always gonna be together on every holiday i'm like well my sons have spouses and they have families mm -hmm. and so how can you demand that your children be with you every holiday when yeah. you know you have and so it's it's like that kind of thing so then when it ends up that they end up not having anybody with them on any holiday because they are so it's you fine. know bent hell bent on mm -hmm. if you're not you know come on you have to I mean it's like times change and we have to change with the time because the you know, they'll say to me well how can and you don't even live near any of your kids doesn't that bother you and Paul's like yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> I mean I expected them to grow up I expected them to live their lives and right. you know I said you know Here's what we do. We co we commit to one holiday a year, one holiday that we know we're all going to be together. Now they come and go. Maybe somebody, you know, but there's one holiday a year that we're all going to be together because with my family, everybody has crazy schedules. Mm -hmm. You know, you got the 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 one that's that's you know the the. the <laughs> the firefighter and you know two of them are nurses and two of them are entertainers and so it's like who knows when they can do so we sit down at the beginning of the year and we say okay this is the holiday we're committing to <clears throat> and that's the holiday that we all make sure we try to be together yeah. but it's just that kind of thing and how we get things set in our mind like or i pray in a certain time of day if i don't pray in the morning oh my goodness you know, if I don't pray at night before I go to bed, oh my goodness. God doesn't care. That's right. That's right. God doesn't care mm -hmm. what time you pray. That's right. You know, That's so right. I think that like those are the kinds of things that we that we have to try to help people move away from and help them to understand that. And the, the the thing is that how is your faith like incarnational for you? The thing for most of us, and I know it was that way for me for a long time, we get the faith that's fed into us. 
Mm -hmm. right? We get all that, whatever's fed into us, the faith practices, the beliefs, it's not our own. We take what's given to us and that's what we hold. And, but when you're on a walk of discipleship and discernment of your own, there are things that the Holy Spirit is going to give to you. And those things may be way different from the things that you've already been told. And especially if you are dedicated to praying and studying, stuff is going to happen. And, and sometimes it's going to be some stuff that will shake your faith mm -hmm. because then you wonder, well, why did why did they tell me this all this time? And that's not even the truth, but yes. that's what they believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you may have, a, a, have to have to have a reckoning with yourself about your own, you know, beliefs and where are you going to go with that? But, you know, time moves on. And so we look, you know, like I, I always, Look at it this way. It's like, okay, I didn't grow up with computers, but my youngest son computers his whole life, right? He like he doesn't know life without computers. He, because we had one in our house from the time that he was that from the time he was born. And so we always have to be aware life is always life is always changing. Changing. And we have to change too. The yeah. things. I mean, if you look at, if you look at the church in the in in the, you know, medieval times, and you look at church now, it's not the same. No. So why should would we think that it has to stay the same as we move into the future? No. You know, Can't. we've just been through a big change, a huge change. COVID made a big shift. How huh. many churches ever did online worship before <laughs> COVID? Of course, there yeah. were some. Now, who does online worship? Everybody, <laughs> right? So yes. to say that we don't that, that we won't change or can't change, like change is inevitable. And when you decide that you're not going to, then you end up getting left behind. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, so, but like I said, it's, there is no right and wrong because we're all individuals and just like this faith community that we're a part of, we are one unique expression among all of them. And so we figure out what works for us how we can best live into being the beacons of light that God has called us to be as, as a unique unit with all of these unique individual lights that are part of it. Yes. And then that's when we're doing the best that we can do. Yes. But again, we're not perfect and we're never going to be. So to look for perfection means that we're, and you know, and there's nothing wrong with failing. Failure is a good teacher. There is nothing wrong with failing. So, you know, so, okay, you throw an idea out there. Well, yeah, go ahead and do it. And if you fail, fine. Then, you know, okay, that didn't work. But what can I learn from that not working? Ah, yeah. oh, yes. But God is with us. Yes. And we will be well. I think. <laughs> I we know that. Well. Yeah. Got it. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Be well. nope. like Jessica, was, whether it was Jessica or Robin who said it was not going to be easy. No. Nope. Yeah. But we will be well. Yes. I so if all hearts and minds are clear, yes. we're almost a half an hour over now. I'm going to yes. ask um, Marilyn, because you, you've been very quiet tonight. You, haven't, you have not joined the conversation at all. Yes. I'm going to ask you to, to um, say a prayer to send us into the rest of our evening. Okay. Um, based on our conversation tonight, um, it's more of an encouragement um, because of all the noise in the world. And we need to be reminded that we are precious to God. 
Amen. Um, we receive the grace of God, not because we deserve it, but because of God's unconditional love for us. Appreciation for this gift should fill our hearts with humility, knowing we have been given something we could never achieve on our own. Let us share God's unconditional love with each other. As we leave this meeting tonight, let us pray for each other according to God's grace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. 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 Beautiful. Amen. Have Amen. a good evening, a restful oh, evening, okay. and a good rest of the work we, uh, the rest of the week. And June and Yvonne just keep getting better. Yes. Yes. Faster. Feel better, ladies. Feel better. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank and you. Those of Enjoy you the who, rest of the week who come into the sanctuary, I will see you on Sunday. See you Sunday. Okay. All right. Sunday. Good good night. Night. Okay. Night. God bless you all. Take good, good care, night. everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. And every, ladies. everyone, thank you. Thank you thank for you. tonight. Thank you, Pastor. Bye-bye, Pastor. Bye. Bye. Thank welcome. you, sisters. Thank you all. Every sister yes. that's yeah. that's on. Yeah, it was great. It was, yes, yeah. it was. Thank right. you. Okay. Needed, I needed all of that. <laughs> Amen. 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 Okay, good night. Good night.